Hello and welcome to our webinar this morning. Um, today I'm going to talk about player engagement, the good, the bad, and the great. My name is Isaac Rosroom. I'm Chief Product Officer here at Delta DNA. Um, and the, the reason that I um oops, where do I get this going? Um, the reason I want to talk about what makes a great game is I think it's it's sometimes hard in the industry to really identify what what the great games out there are. And you know, we tend to drift towards the charts a lot. Um, but of course that is a little bit driven by how much money you can spend on UA. And so when you start to look at the games that are in the top 100, some of them are great, some of them are okay. I mean, obviously with um, the rise of things like Hyper Casual, it's, it's easy to get a lot of installs now, um, but that doesn't necessarily make them a great game, or at least in, in my mind, doesn't make them a great game. So how how can we use, and you know, obviously at DLTNA we worry a lot about uh, data, how can we use data and, and metrics and kind of measurements to identify a great game? So, you know, one of the key metrics that people have always honed in on uh, when it comes to, to games is day one retention, right? So if you've got Google day one retention, that means people love your game. But what, what we found over time is, of course, that day one retention can be a bit genre specific. So, you know, casual games tend to have really good day one retention, more core games, not not as good. And, and obviously when you start to get on things like social casino, they're even lower again. And that's just a natural um, consequence of the genre. So then that's not really fair either. And so then you can start to look at monetization stats. So how about opt out, right? So let's say I got a face and opt out, that must mean I've got a great game. Um, yeah, I mean, it means that people are spending and that's, that's good, but of course, it's much easier to get a 30 sample if you have quite a niche game with a really strong IP that caters to a kind of smallish audience um, rather than a very broad audience. And so, you know, there's a question mark there about is a game um, truly great if it only, oops, sorry, I'm just looking at questions, if it only caters to a small audience. So, um, so I have been thinking about this a lot, and I think one of the one of the keys, it might not be the the kind of the one metric to rule them all, but I think one of the the key things you can think about what makes a great mobile game is player lifetime. So, so what is player lifetime? So when I talk about player lifetime, I'm talking about the expected number of days that a player will play in a game over their life. Now, of course, that's a little bit tricky because, you know, if a player installed last week, they've only had a limited opportunity to actually play, like, you know, the maximum number of days they could play is seven days. But it's still interesting to think about how engaged someone is by how many days out of the number of days they could play, they actually play. And of course, what this is in, in, in kind of nuts and bolts is the sum of the retention curve. So you add up your retention curve and you get the expected number of days that a, that a player in a cohort on average will play the game. And this can tell you a lot about, and you know, the shape of this curve and, and the absolute numbers can tell you a lot about how your game is engaging players. And I think, that to me is a sign of a great game because it's it's kind of covering all the the bases early on you're getting people really enthusiastic about the game they're getting through the mid game um and, and they're kind of learning how uh, the environment works for them and obviously over a long period of time they're coming back to it and they're staying engaged and they're consuming the new content that you're rolling out to them or they're engaging in the meta or whatever mechanics you have to, to drive long-term retention on the kind of business side, obviously, the simplest model that most people use for LTV is to basically multiply through the opt-out by this lifetime. So, you know, when you're thinking about it from the business of games, this is a really important number because it's one of the key components to how you're going to model out your, your revenue forecast and start to make decisions about what CPIs uh, you can you can work with to guarantee that you're going to have a return on investment. And, you know, when we've looked at hundreds of games uh, in, in this way, at LCDA, and obviously most games have, you know, a lifetime between five days for, for very, very casual games that don't, don't have a very long lifespan, so 50 days for a few more core games and um, games with very high engagement. So, um, and in fact, I've, you know, the first bit of stats we've got here is actually play a lifetime by genre. And what's really interesting, I think, is that there is a really stark difference between the different genres. So, like casino and puzzle games have the longest lifespan. Um, you can see here at the top. So casino games have a you know median casino game has a lifespan of 25 days. So that means that out of a year, a player will play on 25 days on average. Um, puzzle games a little bit lower, but but not much. They, you know they kind of average 15 days out of a year. And then action and simulation games have the lowest down at nine days. So you can see actually by genre, there's quite a big difference. You know, casino games uh, and puzzle games are kind of like 
two to you know, even three times uh, the level of overall engagement that some of the other genres have. And of course, what this means is that you know, a casino game with half the up-dow of, say, a sports game will have the same LTV. I think that's an important thing when we start to compare games. You know, just having the opt-out or just having um, one number doesn't tell you the whole story about how that game performs. And so it's important. That's why I think this is such an important um, number to look at. And obviously it's hard to measure because you have to have a lot of data and, and we're lucky here at Delta Navy do. But, um, but this is the kind of one of the key numbers, I think, to, to understand how your game works. Um, so what I thought was interesting is to take a step back and start to look at how the player lifetime compares to retention KPIs. So people lean on retention KPIs a lot to, to understand how their game is engaging their players. And so what I thought was really interesting is if, if you do have like, you know, we've got 10,000 player cohorts with at least a year of data, let's go back and see what day one retention was like for all these different cohorts that we now know what their actual lifetime was. And I mean, what I find really interesting is that there's almost no correlation between day one retention and player lifetime. So if you have, you know, obviously you can see down in the bottom corner here, um, if you have sort of 30% day one retention, okay, yeah, the, the player lifetimes are not going to get above sort of 10 days. But once you start to hit 35, you know, towards 40% day one retention, which is typically where, where people are aiming, um, regardless of genre almost, um, you, there's no, there's no correlation between that and, and the lifetime of the player. So, so, you know, Again, I, I've said this multiple times in other talks, and it's kind of one of our, our kind of things here at Delta Navy going on about day one retention is not on its own is not enough to make a successful game. It's you know it's obviously good to have high day one retention, but if you're optimizing for day one retention constantly, you, you're not going to get to the point where you'll you'll have a, a, a highly engaging uh, game in the long term. Looking at day seven, day seven obviously is a lot tighter. So you can start to see a much more uh, you know, solid trend between day seven going up and the lifetime going up, but still there's a factor of three. So again, if, you, if you're targeting um, you know, 15 to 20% day seven, there's still like a factor of three between the, the lowest and highest lifetime. So, so again, it's a good number to optimize against, but it's not gonna be the be all and end all in terms of long-term engagement. Um, and then finally, looking at day 30, we still, you know, day 30, you are getting a much tighter look at what's going to happen long term, but there's still a, a big gap there. And you can start to see, obviously, when we look at the different genres, how they um, have slightly different shapes in the relationship they have between the, the retention KPIs and, and the lifetime, which is which is interesting. And, you know, it's a, definitely a function of the mechanics that those games use to engage players because they're all slightly different and they have, they get on board at slightly different times. and. Um, and then manifest themselves in slightly different ways. So I thought that's a very interesting kind of uh, fly through of how lifetime relates back to the standard retention KPIs that, that people tend to lean on. I think, you know, what I'm trying to show here is, and I'm not trying to say that you, you shouldn't be using um, these retention KPIs because everyone is and, and they're very, very important. But if, you know, just optimizing for these alone is, is not necessarily going to make you uh, have a great game or what I'm going to define as a great game. I think um, one of the key things that, that I've started to notice in, in, in kind of those trends is that there's a really key difference between what I'm going to call great games and good games. So, so everyone can probably agree that, you know, if, you, if you're down in the bottom left corner of all these plots, unfortunately, you've got a bad game. Um, and so, you know, that you just got low retention. Um, that's going to be true throughout the entire lifetime of the game. And that's, that's a very core cool problem that you need to work on. However, what, what I get a little bit more concerned about is games that have really good initial retention. So, you know, you've got, you can see in those charts, you've got games that have really good day seven and day 30, but um, they're not progressing, not kind of seeing that through for the, the longer lifetime of the player. And so, you know, what they're doing is getting a lot of energy in the early stages of the gameplay, but they're not, sort of um, capitalizing on that later on. And so that's why, I, you know, in this uh, analysis here, I started to, to try to split out what I'm calling great games and good games. And the way I've done that is basically to take the ratio of day 30 to day seven. So what I said is, a, you know, to be basically not a bad game, you have to have a ratio of day 30 to day seven, which is less than two. 
Um, but the difference between a great game and a good game is they have a ratio of day 180 retention to day 30, which is less than five. And so what I've done here on the right, you can see I've got three curves. These are um, averages of the games as classified or the cohorts of players I've classified into, into bad, good, and great. And what you can see, um, and you know, don't worry too much about the absolute numbers here, but it's the shape of the curves, which is interesting, right? So, so sort of bad games, they take off and then they plateau very quickly. But good games do almost the same thing. They just have a slightly higher initial uh, level of engagement. And you can see that you know the good games and the great games are starting to split off around maybe day 30, day 40. Um, and then the great games really power through, right? So what we're seeing is that, you know, let's say in a, in a good game, after, let's say, well, let's say down here is like a month. After a month, a, a good game has got a player to play, let's say five days, right? Actually, a great game is exactly the same. So a good game and a great game, they're probably going to get uh, a player to play five days out of the first month. Cool, right? But the key difference here is that a, a player in a good game only has less than 10 more days to play in their entire lifetime. So, you know, you've got a third of all the gameplay already used up in the first uh, month. Whereas a great game is going to have players playing like 25, 30 days plus. So, you know, you're only, only a small amount of their engagement, you know, in that, in that case, it would be, I don't know, like a less than a fifth of their overall engagement has happened in the first month. So you've, you know, you've, you've basically built this long lasting relationship with the player. Whereas obviously in a good game, they're already starting to run out of steam um, when it, uh, even after the first month. Okay, so that's my, my kind of good, great and bad. And, and, you know, the numbers are down here in the bottom left, but roughly speaking, when we look at games in our, in our system in Del TNA, 60% of games are bad. That's a large number, but that's kind of the way the industry goes. 20% um, of games are good and 20% of games are great. I think that's a little bit of a shame because it's, you know, yeah, fair enough, 40, 60 uh, on bad versus better than bad. But, you know, half of the games that are actually really successful at getting players in the door and, and engaged and, um, and wanting to play the game are not sort of carrying that on longer term. Um, to, to get the benefit or get the value back out of the player, or even, you know, even from the player's perspective, then the players invested a lot in that first month. They're not getting anything out of that. They've kind of exhausted the, their potential in the game by that stage, which is kind of sad. Um, so that's, that's my kind of good, good, great and bad. We're going to do a little bit more of a deeper analysis on that. Well, actually, sorry, there's some, some rough KPIs here, which kind of show you a little bit more how the numbers break down. So, so what's interesting is for, for great games, good games and bad games, actually in, in this, because it's a kind of mix of lots of different games and lots of different um, curves, the D1 retention is not very different. Um, and even, you know, D7 between great games and good games, uh, not that different. Starting to drop off at day four, uh, 30. Um, but you can see the difference between great games and good games is like, you know, day 365 retention of great games is 3%. Whereas the good games are less than 1%. And that has a massive impact on the lifetime. Obviously, bad games have you know, good initial engagement potentially, but then drop off very, very quickly. Um, I think this kind of highlights what I was saying before that you know, the numbers, early numbers that you might see and the numbers we might use to optimize traditionally in analytics, which would be day 30, day seven, there's a little bit of a hint there that, that things are not going the right way, but it's not enough to kind of understand how that long-term engagement is going to work. So what do great games do differently? So this is where it starts to get a little bit interesting. So we started to look at, um, you know, obviously for all these different cohorts of games, what is the sessions per day? Simple, simple number that uh, you can measure on every type of game. Um, and what's interesting is that great games start with a higher number of sessions per day and, and carry on with that. So you know, a great game will have, you know, day zero, day one, they'll be looking at um, three and a half plus sessions per day. And even after a year, they'll still have players playing well over two sessions a day. Good games start high as well, but they drop off really quickly. Um, and then obviously bad games, they don't get as much initial engagement in terms of repeat play. Um, and then they're dropping off really quickly. I think the You'll see this again in, in some of the charts that great games are sustaining themselves, whereas good games and, and bad games are 
very uh, highly engaging to begin with and then dropping off quite quickly. So what's interesting is when you start to compare this to minutes per session, and this is where it starts to get really, really interesting. So, so what I find really interesting is bad games, what I've classified as bad games, have really, really long first sessions, um, much longer than, than good and great games. And they drop off really, really rapidly. So basically, they're burning players out too quickly. They're letting players get through too much content. Um, they're not having any natural place for them to, to sort of break their session. And they're not guiding players towards a repeat session or, or, or a kind of sustainable pattern of play. They're just giving people a lot of stuff early on. Um, and the players are loving it, and they're going through it, but then they've got no reason to return. Good games are doing the same kind of thing, but not quite as bad. They've still got quite long session times. But, but what's interesting is great games have very consistent session times, basically from the beginning, right? So there's a little bit of drop, obviously, when you have the onboarding the period in the first session. You need to have a little bit of extra time to get the players going. But very quickly, great games kind of set in a natural um, session length that doesn't change very much over the lifetime of the player. And that, I think, to me, when you marry that with the number of sessions per day, it shows you that there's a certain amount of design that goes into great games, which is about keeping a sustainable pattern of play with the player. It's, it's very much about putting the player in a pattern that they can, they can do for a very long time. You know, then it's not making it too onerous on the player. Uh, in terms of consuming the time, of, you know, how much time they have in their day. Um, you know, it's not, you don't, you're not delivering too much content, but also you're not boring them. So there's a balance there. And these are very finely balanced games that, that allow themselves to, to kind of do that. What I think one of the problems that, and I think this is kind of my, my thoughts on this, bad and good games are probably optimized towards metrics, which are a little bit, short-sighted so things like optimizing only for day one retention or optimizing only for, for revenue in the first seven days that leads you down a path to, to making these very high engaging um, games in the first week but then they drop off very quickly and that you know as we've seen in the lifetimes leads to sort of factors of two um, lower li lifetime which is naturally the potential that, that the game the player has to, to re either return revenue but even just to play in the game and then um, and be a positive uh, contribute to that community. So um, in terms of pacing, so here I've, I've sort of made a table because obviously John, very, you know, blended a lot of genres in here and, and you know, I'm, I'm willing to admit that the average numbers here are a little bit uh, misleading. So here is the first session length in minutes for bad, good and great games um, across all the different genres that, that, that we kind of track, right? And you can see a kind of fairly standard pattern here that, the, that great games actually have pretty moderate first session times, maybe only 10 to 15 minutes, even less for, for simpler games. Um, and so, you know, and you're definitely seeing that the good and the bad games are, are really trying to keep the player in that first session really for a very, very long time. That means that they're naturally going to progress through a lot of the game. Um, they're going to, you know, go sort of too far and have nothing left to achieve or in their mind, nothing left to achieve in the game by the time they finish that, that first session or even that first couple of sessions. So, I mean, I think the message here is definitely, you know, when you're trying to engage players early on, you've got to leave them wanting more. And that, that obviously comes down to game design. And so I think, you know, pacing, one thing we've seen a lot here when we work on games is that pacing in free play games is, is really, really, really important because, you know, a player, once if a player gets into a game and they like it, but they know that they can grind all the content in a month and that's, that's it, they're going to finish it, they're not going to monetize because, you know, they just don't see the return on the investment. If, if they know that if they just play a lot for a sustained amount and, and that'll be it, then there's nothing to motivate them. They're not, they don't think they're going to get a lot of repeat play and a lot of repeat value out of any monetization they do. And so, you know, I think the challenge here is that even games that seem that seemingly have loads and loads of content, they can, they can fail, they can fall into this kind of good category if they don't balance the pacing in a way that means that players are moving through the content in a sustainable way that works both for the developer and for the player. Um, this is a slightly different concept, but I wanted to talk about it here just because it, it's something we're thinking about a lot here, um, and it, it is a natural kind of analog for what we're talking about here, which is that 
like the idea of having hangouts and hangovers and burnout, right? And so, you know, I'll, I'll explain the example here, but I'll, and then I'll talk about how it marries back to what we've been talking about. So let's pretend that I'm making offers in a game and I make offers every week. So, you know, I make an offer in the first week. Um, and sorry, let, let's just pretend I'm making an offer this week and I want to measure um, opt-outs over time. So I make an offer this week, that's week one. Uh, next week is nothing, you know, the following couple of weeks is nothing. What will happen, obviously, if I make an offer to the player um, to, to buy something or to do something, that will boost opt-out, right? Or, or it should anyway. But what tends to happen is that in the next week, you know, let's say I have a control group that I don't make the offer to, the next week I'll see a hangover because mo a lot of the, the spend that I've got in my offer week is actually being pulled forward from, from week two. So what I'm doing, rather than actually boosting the overall uh, revenue of my game, what I'm really trying, I'm doing is borrowing money from next week and getting it this week. Um, and a lot of that, you can have the same kind of concept for engagement. So if you, you know, if you have loads and loads and loads of content in there, you're not, and, and cool players are playing it, you've got good short-term retention, um, you know, you've got higher uh, conversion rates early on, a lot of that is actually just borrowing that engagement, borrowing that conversion from week two or, or some later point. And so, you know, what you end up with is a hangover. And then one of the challenges with engagement is that if you're giving the players a hangover, there's a natural friction there for them to, to drop off, right? Because they've got this, you know, you've got an unsustainable, you can't keep delivering as much content, as much amazing stuff to them. When they have a bit of a dip the next week, then they're already on a path to churn. I think this is where, you know, it's important. And obviously what in this example is much more about um, like monetization design and campaign design, but the same logic applies when you talk about engagement. You, you, you need the player needs a kind of consistent um, level of engagement. And if you try to juice your, your short-term metrics by dropping lots of stuff in, you're putting, you know, you can't keep that up as a developer and the player can't keep that up either. So it doesn't help anybody. So how do you do this with game design? Well, traditionally, and, and I'm, I'm struggling for examples that weren't this, uh, you use time blockers. So, um, and you know, this is like standard free to play mechanics 101, right? So um, we've got all sorts of time uh, mechanics in free to play games. The classic ones were energy and lives. So you know, energy gives you a really simple way to, to give the player a sort of currency they can use uh, as, they, as they choose almost um, in a session. But once they run out, then that's it. Um, and that's pay to play. Lives, a similar kind of, very similar kind of thing, obviously for games that, that where that concept makes sense. Um, when we go to more uh, core games, build timers or, or other kind of timers like that make more sense that you know, players can't interact with certain bits of content or they can't get um, resources from certain bits of, of content um, without waiting for a timer to expire. Um, and then what's interesting, of course, is there's more modern examples of reward timers where rather than completely blocking the player from making any progress, what you do is you, you wind back how much rewards they can get so they can still play the core loop of the game, but they're not going to get rewarded as much. Um, and what's interesting is that so these are the kind of classic examples. And here, you, there's some fairly classic um, games that use that. So always really energy and Looney Tunes, um, lives and homescapes, world timers in, in Star Trek Fleet Commander, and then obviously Clash Royale was one of the first games to use these kind of reward timers. Um, just some more kind of concrete examples that I think are, are interesting because, well, one thing I say that the Clash Royale sort of reward timer mechanic in general feels nicer because you're not blocking the player. So the, the other ones kind of lock them out, um, and that's a negative experience, which obviously can create a little bit of friction and, and therefore churn. Um, reward timers don't lock the player out; they can keep engaging with it, but obviously they're not getting, uh, they're not making as much progress in the game. Um, another example, and the, we put Marvel Strike Force here, but obviously there's other many other games in this in this field. Um, Star Wars Galaxy Heroes being one of the key ones. Um, and these games use daily task lists to kind of drive sessionization, right? So, you know, you in Marvel Strike Force, similar to a lot of these, um, a lot of these games, you have a defined set of tasks that you need to do every day. And if you do those, you get 
quite a chunky reward. And of course, for each one of these these things, you get a reward as well. So there's a sort of like a the reward pool that you can um, you can access every day. Um, and once you've finished this task list, you, you've got kind of pretty much all the rewards that you can possibly get. So there's a natural kind of daily cadence um, that drives your gameplay. And so what that means is that there's kind of two nice things about that. One of it is one of them is that you can drip feed in new content, um, and also you can onboard players with these task lists. So when you start out in these games, you have a sort of small number of things that's achievable, and then you build it up over time to make sure that you're not overwhelming the player with a lot of complexity. Um, but also when you add new content um, into the game, you can drop it into the the task list and, and drive players towards that. And you can always keep it fresh that way. So even for for quite um, high level players, you know, you can gear it towards their level and keep them keep them interested, right? So this is quite a nice way to have um, sort of a natural sessionization without really, you know, making the player feel like you push them out or you block them. Um, and this creates a kind of nice pattern of sustainable play. Another interesting example we're starting to see in AR games is that um, in AR games, the content you can access is very much defined by where you are. Um, and so, you know, you can only really access content in your general vicinity. Um, and then once you've engaged with those pieces of content, they, they then start timers. I mean, the reality is all of this stuff is based ultimately on timers, even daily task lists are daily. Um, but what's interesting, of course, about using uh, your, your vicinity in an AR game is that then you can start to have mechanics that expand that out. And in Walking Dead, they have this interesting kind of uh, VIP mechanic where you can buy a 30-day pass to expand your field of, of vision. But you can imagine um, not this doesn't have to be tied to monetization. You could use that mechanic um, I, in any other way, even if it's just naturally part of progression, um, to, to keep a little bit of a handle on how long the players are actually engaging in, in the game and how long their sessions are. And of course, there's there's other options out there. Um, you know, in general, what what we would recommend is soft reward blockers rather than locking players out. And so you can imagine scenarios where you you know maybe have a a reward multiplier on the first 15 minutes of play every day. Maybe you have a reward multiplier on the first session every day. Maybe every four hours you have a mechanic where people can come back and have a boost. Um, all of these mechanics kind of fall into the same category where you're basically having a time um, a timed window where people can progress faster and so then they'll naturally build their gameplay around that. And of course, the nice thing here is that once you've got that system, you can optimize it using analytics to, to really get down to the session times that you want and then you know looking forward to actual lifetime engagement levels that you want. Um, so that, that was all I wanted to, to talk about um, today. The, I think the key thing to take home here is that, you know, the, the retention KPIs are important and optimizing against them is, is still a, a very valid way of building games. But, you know, I, it worries me a little bit that these lot of these good games out there that, that have really good numbers according to the way the industry looks at them, but, you know, they've lost potentially half of their, of their lifetime by not focusing on how their sessionization is working and how they're building long-term engagement past day 30. And I think, you know, hopefully I've convinced you that the secret is to get players in a sustainable playing pattern really early, right? Use your design effectively, make sure the analytics is there to understand how the game is balanced so that you're putting players in a pattern that they can they can continue for months and months and months rather than, you know, optimizing for short-term metrics that will lead to, to kind of hangovers and burnout and churn. Um, and that's all I had for you today. I'll, there has been lots of questions popping up, and so I will start to look at the questions. So, sorry, this takes a little bit of time to to get open. Um, okay, simplest question. Um, oh, it's already been answered, but I was going to say, I'll say it anyway, the slides and the recording of this will be available on our website um, before the end of the week, and that'll be on delcina.com slash events slash videos. So that's an easy one. Um, slightly more hard one. So the question is, about lifetime days, how is that calculated? What's the definition of a day in terms of lifetime? 
Um, so when I talk about it, it's a unique calendar day. So um, so here, the short answer, yeah. So if a player played, so obviously everyone plays on day zero, right? So the minimum lifetime a player can have is, is one day. Um, so let's say a player plays on day zero and day one and then plays again, that would be a lifetime of two days. Um, if a player plays on day zero and plays on day seven and no other days, that would be a lifetime of two days. So it's, it's, it's a, how many active days uh, they've done versus, how, you know, that was actually just how many active days they've done. But of course, as the, as the time since install increases, there's more opportunity to come back and play. Um, and so obviously it gets a bit murky because, you know, in the first week, there's only a, only a week. So the maximum number of days they could play is seven. Um, and so you'd expect them to be playing like four or five when it's 300 days, you know, it, people won't be playing as often. Although hopefully what I've showed is that sustainable games kind of build up a nice pattern of play that, that hits every you know couple of days. But in terms of definition, yes, it's just how many unique days has that player been seen on? Slides are full. And then another question is how do we get the lifetime data do we take an average of the lifetime data of all players and multiply it by opt hour to get LTV? Yes. Um, but of course, the challenge with lifetime data is like if you want an accurate day 365, you need a whole year of the game, right? And people are generally not going to wait a year. And so, um, what most people do, and of course, what we provide in our tool, is a projection of, of this exact number. So, when people talk about lifetime value calculators or lifetime, uh, estimators or churn predictors or whatever what they're really talking about is um from a week or a month of gameplay can i extrapolate out what the, the lifetime curve should look like and and in general you can do that um with quite high precision and so you know i think that i didn't talk about it explicitly in in the um, presentation but i think when we start to talk about optimizing kpis there is another level to this which is you know if you've got uh, prediction tools that you really have faith in, you want to be optimizing for those predictions. So if you can predict, if you have a, a way, um, you know, analytics teams built you a, a LTV calculator or a life, uh, a lifetime um, estimator that you trust, that's what I would be optimizing against when you're in soft launch and things like that, because that lifetime of the player is such a critical um, number to, to design a game against. Um, okay, next question. Can you dive a bit more into the word game genre? Is it very similar to puzzle or are there big differences in actual numbers? Okay, so um, that's an interesting question. I think, I don't think that word games are particularly different from, from other types of puzzle games. It depends on what you mean. I don't think they're different from say match three games or bubble shooters. Um, there's obviously a, a whole world of puzzle games which is starting to go down into like the hyper casual genre. Hyper casual games are totally different. The lifetime hyper casual games is like nothing, like less than five days. They're designed that way. Um, and so I think it's much more about the game design. So if you've designed a puzzle game that, like for instance, Candy Crush, right? I mean, I, I don't know anything about Candy Crush beyond um, what's available. In, in the sort of public knowledge, but you know, it's got hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of levels. It's designed to be highly engaging for a very long time. So it wouldn't surprise me if it has that kind of great uh, lifetime curve. So I think it's much more about how you've designed your game. If you, the puzzle games are a little bit at the moment split. So some of them are designed to have very long lifetime. Some of them are designed to be very short. And if they're designed to be a long lifetime, then I think they all have the same kind of numbers. Um, all right. Next question, do the same learnings on long-term retention apply to freemium PC and console games, which are more hardcore focused? Absolutely. Um, and I think that they're a little bit more challenging because the loops in freemium PC and console games, you know, the core loop is a bit big, obviously, because it's a more core game. So there's more stuff you can do. Um, but that focus on, on engagement long-term is super, super important. And I think, again, name dropping a game that I don't work with and you know, uh, we don't know anything about, but Warframe, I think, is an amazing example of taking I, this kind of approach, right? To my mind, when you look at how Warframe's been designed, it's exactly, they're focusing on really, really long-term engagement. And that's why that game's been really successful. Um, and I think you can look at, there's other examples out there on, on PC and console that are following that kind of path. I mean, 
Um, yeah, so so I think absolutely they can work, but of course it's a little bit more tricky to get balancing right because your economy is just you know it's, just, it's a more complicated economy. You've got probably more um, currencies and more ways to earn things, and so it's a bit harder to get the balancing. So time for a session will be longer naturally, probably more like 20, 30 minutes rather than um, ten minutes, but the concepts are same. Any recommendations on which statistical modeling techniques can be used to model lifetime of high degree of precision? Um, so, to be honest with you, what I've what we've been doing here is relatively simple stuff, and, and most people uh, can get a pretty good idea at a cohort level of what the extrapolated um, lifetime will be by simply fitting. Um, some parametric models. Typically, lifetime curves tend to be um, what what's known as like power law models or um, uh, stretch exponential models, or a combination of the both. So you can you can fit a, a simple uh, mathematical model with a couple of parameters that will you know fit the data you've seen and then extrapolate that out. Once you get down to individual users, you can use machine learning to do that, and that works really well as well. And obviously, you can make a prediction over a cohort. Um, but you can get a long way with, with relatively simple curve fitting models. Um, hopefully that helps. Do you have insights on user generated content games? Um, I want to say no. Uh, I think that there's an interesting loop in those where obviously there's the content producers themselves and the and the people that consume them. User generated content games are quite good because they, there's always stuff coming out, so it kind of follows the same kind of idea. You, there's always something for the user to do, and in general, those games tend to have really great, reasonably short session times. But um, yeah, I don't know. I know it's interesting. Sorry, I'll, I'll I'll pass on that one a little bit. Apart from uh, that, I think the sessionization stuff is still important because obviously you lose a little bit of control over what players are playing, but um, if people are just like burning through 20 different bits of user generated content a day, that is like an hour of gameplay, then I can't imagine that they're gonna be able to sustain that. Okay, uh, why do players stop spending after spending even though good percentage of paid users are active in the game? Um, because the game uh, economy is not balanced properly. So if you don't, well, the number one reason, if you've got spenders, so let's say everyone spends on day one, no one spends after that, so you don't have any repeat spend. Um, but the players are still there. Generally, it's because there's nothing for them to sink the currency into. So if you look at the economy sink source, what you probably find is that spenders, you were super generous to the spenders because um, you gave them like a crazy starter bundle, which was like 200% off or something. Um, and then they've got all this currency or all these things, or they've got like a super powered item that they, that they can use for the whole gameplay. And there's no inflation of, um, you know, the, the game power or anything like that. And so, they don't have any reason to spend again. So usually it's because they're too generous in the early stages to spend this. Or the, and there's nothing for them to sink their, their money into or no reason to. Uh, what would be your advice to avoid relying heavily on content to keep players engaged in a free to play mobile game? Um, you need a core loop that is replayable without having to add lots to it. So it, it kind of scales nicely. Um, if you're going to build a linear game, then you're on the hook to build lots of content. But by linear game, I mean, if you build a game with any kind of map where each thing is a level, you better be able to produce those levels really quickly or have an automated way of generating them. Otherwise, you're going to be on the hook to make a lot of levels. So I, I think the general thing is to avoid a linear path uh, in the game you know, focusing on, look at games like um, Marvel Strike Force, which I talked about, they're really good at building up a game from a from basic whole loop that feels like it has lots of complexity and has lots of bits and bobs to it, but you're still kind of playing the same whole loop and you don't have to modify that too much. So it's, much, it's very scalable. All right, I'll answer a few more questions. Obviously, people <laughs> throwing lots in here, which is good. Um, I'll do two more and then and then uh, we'll cut it off. But obviously, um, it's been really good that everyone has all these good questions. Okay, for a chess or checkers game, can some game mechanic ensure increased daily engagement? Okay, um, I mean it's an interesting question, right? Obviously, uh, you start to talk about meta games there, right? So. Um, 
you know, there's obvious, there's different ways you can motivate people with a metagame. In a game like those, competition is a big motivator. And so having a league system um, where people can move up and down would obviously be very powerful motivator. That works really well for Golf Clash. I think actually, to be honest with you, any competitive, like one-on-one -on -one game, I would look to Golf Clash um, because the mechanics in that game are really, really good for, for long-term engagement. Um, and obviously the, the, the breakdown there of um, tournaments, you know, guild type mechanics, leveling up and leveling down on a, on a weekly basis, that kind of stuff. Um, the other option, of course, is you can start to look at collectibles if, if you think that competition isn't the primary motivator. But to be honest with you, in a game like, in a one-on-one -on -one PvP game, most of the people are there to win. And so any meta you want to build up has to be about how good am I, like how high am I in the charts and things like that. Um, you can obviously have achievements and things, but I, I, my suspicion is that uh, that's something that, that is kind of focusing on how they can take pride in, 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 in improving or, or playing with better players or moving up through something, uh, whatever that is, uh, is probably the right way to go down. Like I say, Golf Clash is a really good example of that. In casual games, last question, in casual games, is scaling difficulty a plus to extend lifetime and improve conversion? Yes. So uh, definitely difficulty is an interesting one here, but I don't think in a casual game at some point, you know, obviously it's good to make sure that early on that the difficulty isn't putting people off because you want to go quite broad in a casual game. Um, but at some point, you, once you've got the players fishing on boarded, they need to feel like they're being challenged. Um, and how you do that is is interesting because you know you've got a very broad base of skills there, and so it's a delicate balance. But I think absolutely you need to have what what I would say it's it's not so much difficulty as much as um, risk reward. So one you've got two options here right um you can either just scale the difficulty of a, of a linear path and so when you get to level a thousand it's just hard and there's nothing you can do about it a better way i think is to have a more straightforward risk reward system where um you know you have your standard difficulty and your standard levels and that's about players progressing but you drop in um via you know a daily challenge or maybe you have if you've got a candy crush style map you've got a split path where people can choose to go down a more difficult path, um, but you you signpost that and you give them a big reward for choosing to take on that challenge. Um, and that really, really helps because then you put in the control on the player that they're not blocked, they can keep doing what they love, but if they want to take on a more um, difficult aspect of the game, they absolutely can. Um, also, I think, depending on what kind of game we're talking about there, but, but kind of raid and guild type things work really well there because you're offsetting something really difficult with the ability to do that in a, in a kind of cooperative way. And um, so people don't feel so punished. So that would be my advice in terms of if you want to put more challenges for people in, in, in a kind of casual style game. Okay, that's it for the questions. That was a lot. Hopefully uh, everyone got something good out of that. Um, and as I said before, the slides and, and the kind of full recording of this will be available on our website, I believe you know, you'll all be kind of contacted with those details uh, after the webinar. So brilliant. Thanks so much for taking the time to, to listen to me this morning. Hopefully that was really useful for everyone. And um, obviously look out on our website uh, and our events page if you want to see any of us talking about this stuff in person or our next webinar. Great. Thanks everyone. And uh, have a good day.